Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I think you've got to park nearly the gra graveyard shift, but um, cheerio to everybody who's got to go. Um, uh, so I've got an interesting point. So we've had the retail perspective, uh, and we've just had the raw materials perspective in terms of uh, some basic ingredients that are necessary for the actual food. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the National Centre for Food Engineering at Stanford University and some of the work we're doing there. It is very much about the engineering of of uh, food manufacture. Um, so it's actually utilizing uh, the, the raw materials and it's the, the processing uh, and the, uh, the equipment and the development of those which are necessary to actually uh, take us forwards. And there's a piece that I want to look at uh, about uh, packaging which brings us into and joins up with, uh, with the retail end of the work and the speakers that we've had this afternoon. Um, just to actually put things into context, we had a lot of information in the previous uh, speaker about, uh, about um, the demands that there are on the resources. Um, there are two aspects on this in terms of the information on this slide. Um, the first is about how uh, British uh, food manufacturing is heavily dependent on uh, UK production in terms of uh, farm output. Um, there's also a little piece about here uh, in terms of um, water usage. Um, and that uh, the, the food manufacturers are spending a, an awful lot of effort trying to minimize the amount of water they, they're using or at least recycling it within the actual process to make themselves sufficient in water. And the same goes for energy. Energy is a big part of the actual cost of the food manufacturer and uh, therefore the cost is a driver, but also the purely ecological aspect of, uh, of, food, of energy generation and trying to minimize that. And so being self-sufficient in energy within the actual food manufacturing process is also a big part of what they're interested in. The other bit is on the right-hand side, it is about, uh, about uh, competing with other areas of industry, certainly within the UK, to actually attract talent into the actual sector to ensure that we've got a strong continuing uh, food manufacturing capability uh, within the UK. And that's just comparing the, uh, the gross value added of food manufacturers to the, uh, the automotive industry. In other words, food manufacturing is uh, nearly three times the size of, uh, of automotive. But as an engineer, most engineers want to go either to do aerospace or to automotive. Very few of them want to come in and work in the food sector. So that's my, uh, my little message for those uh, budding and future engineers. Uh, what are we? Uh, we are the National Centre for Food Engineering, and it's um, nice to be able to come and speak to, uh, to people here at Chester. Um, there are a number of centres of expertise around the actual UK. Um, I believe that uh, we are uh, filling a, a hole where there hasn't been sufficient effort put into the actual uh, food manufacturing capability. Um, and uh, so we are, we are set up with uh, funding from, uh, from HEFKE, with support from uh, the Food and Drink Federation, Natural School Academy, and a number of food manufacturers which I'll come to in a moment. Um, but actually acting as a, as a hub for expertise for the, for the food manufacturers to come and to uh, develop new ideas, new capability uh, within the laboratories. We are very much focused on uh, new ideas. Um, so actually on the previous slide, there was a lot of money being spent on, uh, on innovation. But actually a big proportion of that, the biggest proportion is actually on new product innovation. And uh, one of my roles is uh, to try and leverage more of that spend actually into uh, process innovation, perhaps so that we can actually do more with protein. Uh, as, that would be an interesting way. And there's certainly a lot of people have been coming to me asking about um, uh, spent waste from brewing as a key part of that, and so there, there are clearly some opportunities for us to take advantage of. <coughs> we have, certainly have an educational role, um, so uh, we have a new course in, uh, in food engineering, um, and we're looking at uh, supporting food manufacturers in terms of their, their development. Um, we've, uh, we've got and are developing new expertise and, and uh, facilities in terms of food manufacturing capability. Um, and uh, we're, uh, we're developing that over the next uh, couple of years. Um, list of uh, companies and organizations that uh, we are actually working with. Um, on the top is uh, a series of uh, international and national companies who are all uh, working with us, pledging support in a variety of ways to actually deliver new uh, innovation, new capability within the actual sector. Um, uh, Premier Foods, uh, uh, that uh, chief executive uh, sits on our survival board, he's our chair and uh, keeps us uh, going. And uh, certainly had a lot to say about uh, supermarkets, apologies. He did mention Waitrose actually, <laughs> um, but he did mention most of the others. Um, 
Uh, but certainly they're all interested in, in a range of engineering capability in terms of uh, new idea, new capability in terms of uh, producing new solutions for, uh, for the food sector. Uh, we've certainly clearly got some direction from the Food Greek Federation and National Skills Academy. Um, but it's not only food manufacturers, but it's also uh, those, uh, those technical supporters of the sector in terms of developing new, uh, new technology, new engineering capability. So the equipment and systems providers are also part of the, uh, the organization, so they're actually working with us to actually drive forward uh, new innovation in the sector. Uh, down the bottom there, a little bit about uh, the funding from HEPGE and uh, a small amount from the uh, UK Commission for Education and Skills. So, uh, these are the main companies, uh, or at least a, uh, a section of the companies actually working with us, now out of date, United Biscuits are no longer United Biscuits, but uh, otherwise it's a range of uh, sectors, um, that from dairy, um, through confectionery, um, uh, through to um, uh, fresh foods in terms of the seafoods in particular, um, and then into uh, a broad range of uh, sectors, uh, particularly William Jackson supplying not only the actual uh, uh, our market into the retail, but also the, the, the food manufacturers directly. Um, we're working on the uh, the brewer interests in terms of uh, actually working with us, but um, you can see that uh, Cargill on the top right take us from the raw materials through to uh, the delivery of uh, both. Uh, Effective food, but also uh, snacks that uh, we also enjoy from uh, Mars and Mondelez and the like. How have we actually uh, developed? This is a, a chart which sort of takes us uh, and describes where we've uh, got to at this point. Um, as, uh, as here, and as we've been hearing from uh, other people, there's a considerable amount of work being done on uh, nutrition. So the food science work, uh, Sheldon Hallam has been, uh, been running and has uh, been established and working with. Uh, Regional industry uh, in and around uh, Yorkshire, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, particularly, um, but that's also extending to uh, century work with, uh, particularly with the supermarkets, in terms of uh, supporting their uh, quality process. Um, a very big piece of work uh, being done on over many years on packaging, and that's both in terms of the uh, the marketing element as well as the actual uh, uh, structural integrity of packaging, and therefore different ways of actually uh, containing product, both protecting it. Um, and uh, exhibiting it on the shelf, um, but also, as I'll give you a little example of developing new ecological materials that are actually going to replace uh, polymer-based uh, packaging, uh, but with still the functional capability that we uh, expect uh, to manage, at the very least to maintain shelf life, but really to actually challenge that, to actually take it, uh, take it much longer. Okay, so from going from left to right, that's then taking us into uh, the new food program that we have uh, at Sheffield Hallam and then into the centre of excellence, uh, developing uh, the capability uh, to actually uh, uh, design and develop the new techniques and uh, new processes for the sector. Um, so that the, the type of things we're working on range from uh, machinery. Um, we're doing a piece of work with uh, one of the largest sandwich manufacturers in terms of hygienic design of, it, of equipment. Um, Adapt, uh, adaptable and reliable production processes. Um, are they are very conscious about their, their productivity, their OAE rating, and actually getting more from their equipment than they currently do. Some of that is about good manufacturing practice, but others is about uh, redesigning their equipment so that it's actually um, available for, for manufacturers for a much longer period of time. Um, very much uh, looking at uh, new technologies in terms of uh, you had uh, CTEC Innovation in here uh, this morning, I think, um, talking about the innovative uh, heating techniques. And certainly there is a lot of work being done in terms of challenging the current uh, practices of uh, achieving good uh, rates of heating, therefore uh, cooking times, both heating and refrigeration in terms of uh, getting to uh, a point at which you can have to be supplied to you. We are challenged by working with SMEs. Um, they are a very different market, but we've certainly got a very big uh, part of our work in actually needing to actually work with them. So let me um, just go into uh, three little examples. Uh, one is on packaging, one's on uh, material flow in terms of uh, uh, fluids, and the other is uh, automation and uh, robotics. So materials flow. <coughs> um, this is a uh, list race is actually taken from some work, uh, some early work from uh, my professor coming at uh, UCL. But as an illustration, 
Uh, but it's also de describing the, the different levels of uh, analysis. Um, we need to get down to some quite detailed uh, areas of work to uh, allow you to actually understand what is actually happening to the material when you put it under severe stress uh, within a, a food manufacturing process. So if you're under, uh, putting it under severe pressure, uh, high throughput rates, um, challenging areas of uh, constriction and uh, manipulation within the actual uh, heating cycle, then we need to look at the uh, at least the meso scale of the actual analysis to actually uh, understand what is actually happening, and to be able to model the processes so you can actually uh, predict what's actually happening during the operation. So an example is uh, tomato ketchup flow uh, within a pipe. Um, this is uh, some of the um, understanding of the, uh, the background work of the analysis of the detailed particle analysis uh, at that meso scale to actually allow you to actually understand what is happening to the actual particles um, as they're being uh, pressurized and developed through the actual process. Meso scale very much sits between the, uh, the micro analysis of the, the atomic scale and the more macro scale that a more traditional computational fluid dynamics actually works at. Um, and it uh, uses um, lattice Boltzmann equation to actually identify the material flow within the actual uh, product and the, uh, the forces that are acting on the individual particles within the actual product. What that does do is, and what then, just looking at the, la the last point on here in terms of the navier stokes equation, navier stokes very much looks at a traditional um, a fluid flow very much looks at um, the challenges that it, well, it is challenged by non Newtonian flow. And what Lattice Boltzmann allowed you to do is to actually look at the actual more, um, the more hydrodynamic uh, an analysis of the particles that are actually in a, a very heavily suspended fluid. And to allow you to actually understand uh, the, 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 the pressures that have been put on the, the individual particles, not just the, uh, the bulk uh, material. So when you start to apply that, you can start to actually understand the actual individual uh, elements within the actual uh, material flow. And uh, the, the, the little illustration there is of uh, particles within a pipe and uh, starting to actually look at them at, uh, in some detail. And so you can actually understand their interaction. And you start to quickly see that uh, they, we, can, we can predict very carefully and uh, very um, strongly the close relationship of the actual material flow um, to the actual prediction of the, on the actual material particles. So let me just, um, so as you go from uh, small numbers of suspension, then clearly they, uh, they, they flow, but what's interesting is as they flow down the pipe, they, uh, they are very constrained and um, they uh, flow down the center because of the actual drag and so on actually on the, uh, the exterior, on, on the exterior of the actual pipe work. And uh, the way in which you actually then get um, drag being generated and the uh, coordination of the, the flow into streams within the material, but also the separation of the particles from the, uh, from the liquid allow you to actually understand the real behavior and therefore the significance actually on the actual processing. Um, so if uh, more of the processing being done is a continuous process within a pipe, so in, in, in terms of continuous retorts, uh, or in terms of uh, overheating or other mi microwave heating within a continuous process, then we need to understand what's actually happening to that flow rate, rather than the, the bulk material as you would typically get so uh, within a larger scale retort. Um, this then shows the actual uh, the change that you get in terms of material flow within the actual pipe work and how the majority of the, uh, the, 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 the heavy solids are actually moving down the center of the pipe work and not down the, uh, the arm on the outside. And, uh, and that then allows us to actually do a lot more work. So the bottom illustration there is actually some work uh, we did for uh, uh, Mondelez, in other words, people with facets, to actually look at uh, um, the challenges of um, switching off a, uh, a very elastic uh, material to actually ensure that you can actually get uh, the right amount of uh, material flowing into the actual mold uh, to actually without uh, the excess and uh, all the challenges that, that gives in terms of the actual manufacturing operation. And this is a, a little illustration of 
all of that being put together in terms of the actual modeling of, uh, of the heavily, heavily suspended fluid in a pipework with a constriction, uh, reds being high pressure and uh, blue being uh, low pressure, um, but also the way in which the actual uh, particles are actually aligning uh, within it, but also importantly the pressures which are being generated within those particles. So it's not just the fact that they are being aligned and being driven down the centre of the actual pipework, which is uh, helpful to understand in terms of the, the way the, uh, where the, the, the material is concentrated, but also whether there has been any damage being done to the actual particles as part of this process. So if we uh, see this simplistically in the soup, we don't want the uh, plaster particles to be damaged beyond the point at which the texture and therefore the actual uh, the, uh, the way in which we enjoy the, 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 uh, the food is actually a comp uh, compromised by the actual processing of the actual operation. Normal computational fluid dynamics won't give you that analysis. Um, the, uh, the work that we've done in terms of uh, this very, our own code and running our own parallel uh, computational systems will actually allow us very much greater detail that understanding of, uh, of that material capability. I have got a, a few other examples, but I just want to um, just uh, run down. I've, have I got one minute? Two minutes. Two minutes. So I just want to um, just give you a little insight into uh, particular uh, materials work. We had potatoes as uh, protein. Um, I was pretty disappointed that he uh, now wants to use all of uh, potatoes for good protein. We were actually hoping to, actually, uh, to, to utilize the starch as part of the packaging process. So uh, we're working on a, a new material to actually provide a barrier coating to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to packaging with the equivalent performance of uh, conventional polymer packaging. So starch is in one element, the other is clay. The combination will give us a very good, both oxygen and water-based uh, barrier properties to actually uh, uh, act as a, as a barrier going onto, the, uh, on, onto a paper board um, uh, to actually provide that barrier coating. So these are the actual performances that we're getting in terms of uh, water uh, vapor passage. So that uh, on the left is uh, uh, a, a normal paper-based packaging. It's no use at all. On the right-hand side is a polymer in terms of the, the WDTR rating in terms of 10. We are now achieving 12 uh, utilizing uh, the combination of starch and clay as a, as a packaging film we go on to coated cardboard and these are some uh, SME scans of the uh, packaging. The one on the right hand side is two layers of, the, uh, of this um, barcode coating which is uh, now commercially available for, uh, for you to actually utilize as a, as a barrier film uh, replacing uh, polymers as a, as a packaging material. So I've had my signal so uh, I'll leave it at, uh, at that and uh, unless there are any specific questions. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, I did pick up on this last one because that intrigues me because if there's a conveyance from the public, yes, people have yes, nanotechnology against the technology against the clays, yeah. I'm sustainable materials in terms of starch and papers. Is that commercially available? You say? It is. It's, yeah. 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 It's, um, it's, uh, it's a piece of work that was done uh, in partnership, as, as the slide said, between ourselves and Karlstad University of Sweden. And uh, it's uh, now been uh, patent approved uh, and is now commercially available through Barcode. Barcode has been set up to commercialize it. You can share the stuff from one side and the 14 and other side. Papers and get the value of both codes. Maybe we could. Maybe yes. we'll do a joint business here. Yeah. Yeah. One last question was any time. No? Okay, it's good to be fun. Okay, thanks for meeting me.